to explain what fraud proofs are, I'm going to motivate why we actually need them and what is the problem that we're trying to solve. So as we all know, at the moment, there's a really huge trade-off, or it's thought to be that there's a huge trade-off between how much decentralization that your blockchain system has and how much on-chain throughput you can get. And effectively, the argument goes that the, more, the bigger the block size, the bigger the blockchain, the more expensive it is to run a full node, and so everyone will have to run a light client instead. And the problem with light clients is that they accept blocks that are invalid. So if a block contains invalid transactions, um, they, could, they will happily accept that block if the majority of the consensus has actually sort of gained consensus on that block. So for example, if there's a 51% attack, then uh, you could trick a light client into accepting blocks that effectively generate money out of thin air or double spend and, and, or break the protocol rules and so on and so forth because they effectively assume, assume that the majority of the consensus is honest, which is a really bad assumption that we should, we should, we should try to eliminate. So the big question that we might want to ask ourselves is how could we actually make it possible for light clients to reject these invalid blocks, just like full nodes do? Because if a full node receives an invalid block, they will reject it. So how can we make a light client do the same thing so that they too don't have to trust the miners and they don't have to assume that the majority of the consensus is honest. So the solution to this is that we could use fraud and data availability proofs. And this is uh, what I'm going to be present presenting today is based on a paper that um, we, we released last month. And this is a joint work with Alberto from UCL and Vitalik from Ethereum Research. We also have the, the link is on the screen. And also we have code as well. So the basic idea of fraud proofs uh, is effectively that you have light clients and you have full nodes, and light clients only download block headers, and full nodes also download the entire block, including the transaction data. And if a full node detects that there is some invalid transaction in that block, then they will effectively send, send that light client a compact proof that that block contains an invalid transaction. And that, the size of that proof should be significantly lower than the size of that block. So the, big, the original Bitcoin white paper actually um, briefly mentions a concept like this called alerts, uh, which like in, in, like in a single sentence. And the idea of alerts, as Satoshi proposed them, was that a full node could send a light client a message to alert them that the block is invalid. And that would cause the light client to have to re-download the block and validate that block again. But the problem with this, with this is that as a full node, I could just lie to all the light clients and say all the blocks are invalid. And so effectively, the, in the worst case scenario, the efficiency of the system uh, for a light client is no better than downloading the whole blockchain again. So it boils down to running a full node again. So it doesn't really work. Um, also, uh, there has been some discussions in um, Bitcoin space about having compact fraud proofs, which is what I just discussed. But some of these earlier proposals, they propose a different fraud proof for every single way to, to violate the rules of the protocol. So for example, you might have one fraud proof for double spends, one fraud proof for UTXO not existing, and so on and so forth. So what we can do here, or what we're going to do here, is simplify everything so that you only need one fraud proof. And uh, to understand how this could work is we have to remind ourselves um, that we could generalize the blockchain as a state transition system, which is what Ethereum actually does. Um, so effectively, you have a transition function uh, you have, that takes in as input the state of the blockchain and some transaction. And then every transaction uh, modifies the state of the blockchain in some way. And then, so between block X and block X plus one, you have a number of transactions and they modify the state in some way. And in between those transactions, if you apply those transactions sequentially, you have many intermediate states, as you can see in, in the diagram. So what happens if uh, there's, a, there's one transaction is included in the, in the block that has an invalid, that is invalid and modifies the state in an invalid way that is illegal or not allowed? 
Um, so if there's a 51% 51, 51 attack, then a miner could do this and insert this malicious block into the chain and like clients, um, sorry, malicious transaction into the chain and like clients would happily accept it. So we need a way to prove, we need a way for full, full nodes to prove that this has happened so that, so that like clients can reject the block as well. And we need to do this in a compact way. So um, to do this, we need some way to uh, commit to the state of the blockchain uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the block headers. So at the moment, Ethereum uses uh, Patricia tree to effectively represent the entire state of the blockchain in a single root. Um, and you can effectively represent the entire state of the blockchain as a key value store, i.e. The, the, the accounts in the blockchain and values. But recently, um, one of the proposed changes in Serenity is to actually uh, change this structure to, some t to a much simpler structure called the sparse Merkle tree, uh, which is a much simpler uh, way to actually store the entire, represent the entire state as a single Merkle root. And the basic idea of a sparse Merkle tree is that it's basically a normal Merkle tree but with an insanely large number of leaves. So if you wanted, to, for example, to represent every single possible SHA-256 hash, then the size of your Merkle tree would have, it would have two to the power of 256 leaves. And you might be asking, how is it even possible to actually compute this Merkle tree? And actually, there's, there's some neat tricks that you can do, such as, for example, um, if you consider the fact that most of the leaves in this tree will be empty, have no, will have a zero or default value, uh, then, then you can effectively um, assume that the vast majority of the uh, intermediate nodes in this tree will have the same value, so you don't have to, comp you don't have to recompute every single node in the tree. You can just, because you know that the vast majority of these nodes only contain children with zero values. So effectively, it is pretty much as efficient as a standard Merkle tree. And so if we do this, then we could effectively do this concept called stateless clients. So um, instead of imagining the blockchain as a state, transi state transition system, you imagine the blockchain as a state root transition system. Because if we use this, Merkle, if we use this sparse Merkle tree to represent the state of the entire blockchain as a single Merkle root, and you include this Merkle root in every block header, which is what Ethereum is doing right now, uh, using a Patricia tree, then you could also imagine that there are many intermediate routes uh, between block X and block X plus one, or the, the previous and next blocks. And so if you effectively have this execution trace between every, for every single transaction in a block. And so what you can do is you can not just include the final state route in the block header, you can also include um, the intermediate state routes in the block header. So for example, if you wanted to, you could include, after every single transaction, you could include the new state route, which is the new 32-byte 32, 32 state route. Or you could do it after every few transactions. It's basically a trade-off between how big the footprint is and um, how much extra on-chain data that you, that you want to put on the chain. So if you wanted to, so then you could easily generate a footprint um, if you have these intermediate state routes in the blocks. Um, effectively, the fraud proof would consist of uh, the pre-state route of that transaction, the, the post-state route, the transaction itself, and also the witnesses of that transaction. Now, the witnesses of a transaction are simply all of the Merkle proofs of, of um, all of the state uh, keys that a transaction accesses in the state um, Merkle tree. And then you would also need the Merkle proofs for the transaction itself and the pre and post state root. So then this is what effectively what the fraud proof would look like. And so that's all well good. So now we have a working unified fraud proof system that only requires one single fraud proof rather than many different fraud proofs like some of the earlier ideas uh, were proposing. But the problem with this, um, the, bi the biggest problem with this is something called the data availability problem. And the data availability problem is effectively says that, okay, so what if a miner only distributes the, the block headers to the light clients? So the light clients only know the block headers, but what if no one knows the actual transaction data of the block? 
So just because you know the Merkle root for the transactions doesn't mean you know what the, the data behind that Merkle root is. So if a miner does this, then that means um, a full node wouldn't be able to generate a, a fraud proof because they simply would not have the data for that. They would not have the data to generate that fraud proof. So, so we need a way somehow to guarantee the, the data availability or the availability of the data in the blockchain. And uh, Vitalik proposed a neat way to do this called um, uh, using erasure coding. And the, the idea of erasure coding is that let's suppose that you have some data that is X pieces long. Um, what you can do is you can blow up that data to 2X pieces long. And then if you lose any X pieces in that data, you can recover the entire data from any of those X pieces. So what that effectively means is that this no longer becomes a 100% data availability problem. This only becomes a 50% data availability problem because you can recover 100% of the data just from 50% of the data. So what that means is that miners, if they wanted to hide a single, even a single bit or a single byte in the data, they would have to hide at least 50% of the data or not release 50% of that data. So what we can do with this is we can require miners to commit to the Merkle root of, the, of this blown up or erasure coded version of the block data that is extended to two X uh, pieces instead of X pieces. And then clients could use this construction to have a guarantee that the, that the data is available. And so what they could do is they could randomly sample different pieces of that block, of the erasure code block. And if we can assume, if we assume that the miner is trying to do this attack and has hidden 50% of data, then there is a 50% chance in the first sample that you will end up in a um, part of the block that is unavailable. And so if you sample a part of the block that is unavailable, i.e. you request from the network to give you the part of the block that is unavailable, and you don't receive a response, then you, would, then you don't accept that block because, because you think you might, because, because um, you haven't received the response to your sample. And so if you keep doing more samples, you can get a very high probability guarantee um, that the block is actually available. Because it, so th there's, then there's, there would be a one minus two to the power of minus s chance of la landing on an unavailable block if the block is largely um, or fifty percent unavailable. So and if you don't, and again if you land on an unavailable block, you don't receive a response, and then you don't accept the block. The problem with this, uh, uh, and to add to this, um, is that it's not, it's not a problem with this yet. I'll, I'll, the problem with this is in the next slide, but just as I note to this is. Um, you, for this to work, you need a sufficient number of like clients to um, make enough samples to be able to reconstruct the entire data. So for example, like if you only have like one client, then there's not enough clients to make enough samples for 50% to, to sample 50% of the block. So then the scheme wouldn't work. Um, now there are ways to kind of, and also there are ways to kind of get around this or, um, well, or to make it uh, more possible so that you can't fool the first number of clients. Uh, but I'm not going to mention it in this talk. It will be in the full, in, it's in the full version of the paper. And there's also uh, more analysis and uh, graphs in the paper that show how many light clients you need exactly. So the problem with the scheme I've described the problem with the scheme that I've described so far is that um, what if the miner actually incorrectly applies the erasure code? So what if they just insert gibberish in the extended part of the data, right? So then that's not, that wouldn't be useful to anyone because then if you actually lose 50% of the block, then that gibberish data is not gonna help you to reconstruct the entire block. So if you wanted to prove, to, prove this to a light client, then you would basically have to give them the entire original data and then they would have to uh, recompute the erasure code themselves to check that it's correct. And this is going back to square one because you need the entire block to, to, to do this check. So the fraud proof would, 
would be equivalent to the size of the block itself. And that's what we're trying to avoid in the first place. So the way to fix this is that you could use um, multi-dimensional erasure coding. And uh, the idea of, of multi-dimensional erasure coding is that you have, um, you basically arrange the, your, your block data into a square, so you cut it up into a number of pieces, and the, you arrange those pieces into, into a square, and then you apply the erasure coding one by one on each row and column of this square until you can extend it into a bigger square. And so if one of these rows and columns were incorrectly extended, then the size of the fraud proof would be limited to a single row or column because only the light client would only have to uh, make, uh, need proof that one, or one row or column is incorrectly computed to be able to know that the uh, block is invalid. And this is much better because this has an efficiency of, of um, O square root of the block size rather than O block size. And with multi-dimensional, with this 2D coding scheme, so you can, so in the example here, I'm using two-dimensional encoding, but you could go higher, you could use higher dimensions if you wanted to, although personally, I don't think it's worth it because there are other trade-offs. So with this scheme, you, a miner would have to hide 25% of the data to hide the whole square. So here's a graph showing, um, given a light client that makes S samples, what is the probability that they will land on, on, on an unavailable part of the block if the miner has hidden 25% of the square? The high, and the higher the probability, then the higher the probability of um, a light client detecting that a block is not available. So we want the probability to be high. And you can see here that if you do say, if you, after three samples, the, the probability is about 60%. After 15 samples, the probability is about 99%. So, so you, can get, you can get very high probabilities just from a reasonable number of samples. So, so some people might consider that 99% is too, too low. It's like if you wanted 99.99%, you would need 30 samples. But I think 99% is reasonable because what that would basically mean is that if you were a miner and you wanted to do this attack against someone, you would effectively, on average, need to mine about 100 blocks in order to get a chance of mining, of fooling the light client that you want to fool into, a block, into thinking that a block is available when it's not. So that increases the cost of the attack 100x, which, which I think is quite, is, it would make it unreasonably expensive. Um, yeah, we have some performance measurements. I'm not going to go into, into detail to them because I want to take questions. But everything is quite efficient. So under these parameters, I'm assuming that you have an intermediate state route after every 10 transactions. So the size of the fraud proof, will be, uh, the state fraud proof <coughs> will be about 14 kilobytes. Everything is less than a few kilobytes, basically. Um, the, the biggest trade-off, though, is that if you're a light client that wants to have to have a guarantee that the, the data is available, then you also have to actually download something called the access routes, which are basically every single row or, and column in this in this square has its own Merkle root that you have to download, and that does increase the header by about 10x. But you only have to do this if you do want the data availability guarantees. You can still run like super light clients which have no data availability guarantees. But I think like I, I think this is quite a reasonable uh, trade-off. Um, and in terms of computation, it's all uh, it's all quite uh, efficient. The, the generating the state fraud proof uh, looks quite expensive here, but that's because my sparse Merkle tree implementation is quite inefficient. Um, Verifying fault proofs, verifying sample responses, verifying availability fault proofs are all in, in sub millisecond times. So it's all quite efficient. Um, so if you want to look at the paper, the link is there. Code is, code is on GitHub. We have the code for the data availability code, uh, the read, the using erasure coding, also a sparse Merkle tree implementation in Go, and a prototype for the fault proofs itself. Thank you. I'll take some questions now. Uh, 
the reason for not adding, adding another dimension is just simply is just the rate amount that they can that the miner needs to fake. So actually, if you if you add high, more dimensions, the miner it makes it worse um, from a probabilistic perspective because the miner has to hide less part of the pieces of the block to hide the whole block. It's so like with the one-dimensional scheme, you have to hide 50%. With the two-dimensional scheme, you only have to hide 25%. With the three-dimensional scheme, you have to hide 12.5%. So that means that that means you have to sample more sizes to get the same sample more pieces to get the same um, probability of guarantees. And also, the other problem with having higher dimensions is that it um, dramatically increases the number of Merkle roots that a light client has to download. So I don't really think it's worth it unless you have an insanely large block size. And like, or like in insanely large intervals between blocks. Yes. So could this uh, scheme be used uh, in the context of uh, Plasma to force essentially um, the um, operating party to essentially like either they provide the proof or they get slashed? Um, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, this allows somebody to just you, you cannot know if the if the pro provider yeah. of the proof is unavailable, if they're attacked, or if they're just malicious. So, so I'm not an expert on Plasma, but there was a thread on Ethereum research that asked that question, and uh, the response was from Vitalik said that it would be quite reasonable to do that. So like, if you wanted to... Ethereum uh, is fake. Sorry? And the operator puts up some proof. Yeah, with the, with the deposit. I, th I think it would be quite reasonable uh, to do that um, if you wanted to make the Plasma operators um, erasure code their blocks and then make the, the clients have to do have to do samples and maybe you could even actually make it on the main chain that you have that you have, after some amount of time or after some delay you have uh, the main chain sample some of the um, pieces as well for extra security. That would be great because it already uses fast proof cookies. So yeah. Adjust the same amount of proposal. So it would be fun to put it in. Yeah, I think it would be quite reasonable. Question. Yes. That's, yeah. Okay. That works. So, um, so I just uh, wondering uh, if you change uh, one entry in the state, then how big part of the of the erasure coding uh, data structure will change? So, how does do changes like propagate? Oh, so how? So what happens if you change? The structure of what? Sorry, the the state. The okay. So, uh, so our data structures are are based uh, on like tree hashing, which means we we just uh, change a few entries. One each uh, state write just uh, changes a, a single entry yeah. and the logarithmic number of uh, of, of intermediate try nodes. So. Uh, how much data will change in the erasure code after each uh, state write? Um, okay, so let's go back to the erasure code. So this is this is the erasure coded version of the transaction data. So what you're asking is, if you change a single transaction, how much of the erasure code would change? Um, well, first of all, I'm not sure why that would matter because that would change the Merkle roots as well. So so. So I don't think there's a specific attack you can do from that. Um, but it would actually change, it, it would change a significant portion. It wouldn't change the entire erasure code, I think, at least. Yeah, it would, so it wouldn't change the entire erasure code, but it would, say, it would change a, a significant portion of it. So it would change at least, for example, that entire fourth quadrant of the, of the square. But it doesn't really matter because that, that it would also change the Merkle roots of the rows and columns. To your right, back here. To your right. Yep. To your right. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, I was wondering if you guys explored more succinct ways of generating and ver verifying the proof. It seems to me that it could allow you to go to a higher dimensional. Um. Gen uh, yeah. So Vitalik um, has some blog posts on using things like proof of proximity to make it possible to verify that the erasure code was constructed correctly without having to rely on fraud proofs. And so this is, this is like something completely different. Uh, um, like this would be like, if you wanted to completely eliminate fraud proofs, 
then you would need a way for light clients to succinctly verify that the, that the state transitions in the block were valid and also succinctly verify that the erasure code was constructed correctly. And there are some ideas on how to do that, and they're on the Vitalix blog. Um, but there are currently some trade-offs that need to be ironed out. If I recall correctly, um, one of the ideas had the drawback of potentially requiring Merkle, uh, making Merkle branches 100 times bigger in a worst-case scenario. But it's definitely uh, something that people are looking into. Let's give Mustafa another round of applause, please. <laughs>